You've seen his tires, maybe you know him from drag racing. Either way, if you like cars, you've probably heard the name Mickey Thompson. But did you also know that he was murdered in his own driveway? Who did it? And why are they still walking free? Today we're gonna look at the tragic story of one of racing's greats. Let's get you up to speed on Mickey Thompson. Big thanks to NBC's American Auto for sponsoring today's video. <clears throat> Nolan Sykes, 28 years old. Hi, I'm Jeremiah Burton. James Pumphrey, 22-ish years old. Auditioning for NBC's new comedy, American Auto. I'll be reading for the part of the star. Not an audition, in any way, again. We're, we're just doing the promo. Sure we are. So to clarify, you just want me to read a promo for American Auto on NBC? Yes. Which is also the show I'm auditioning for. Nope, nope. Okay, I just had an idea. One of the characters I play is Courtney, mate. I'll, I'll do it just so you can have it. You don't need, you don't Say in Detroit. You just want me to read a promo for American Auto on NBC. Okay, I can do that. I can do that. <clears throat> From the creator of Superstore comes a new workplace comedy that takes the wheels off the automobile industry. Set in Detroit, the corporate executives of Payne Motors are at a crossroads. Will they adapt to the changing times? Or will the wee old lads sit right to the junkyard? I like it. I like it. I can do it one more time. You can stream the first two episodes of American Auto right now on Peacock. And be sure to check out the official season premiering on NBC January 4th at 8, 7 central and streaming the next day on Peacock. Is that it? That's it, perfect. You did so much better than everyone else. Really? Yeah, they all thought this was an audition, but you actually got it. Wait, like I got it? Like I got it, got it? I, I gotta go call my mom. Mom, I'm gonna be on NBC! Mickey Thompson was born Marion Lee Thompson Jr. on December 7th, 1928 in San Fernando, California. He went by Mickey because Marion is the name of a dictionary and would probably mean even more fighting, something that he found his way into regardless. Mickey grew up in the San Fernando Valley, the heart of California's exploding car culture, which means he became obsessed with cars, going fast and going fast in cars. He bought his first car, a 1927 Chevy, when he was 14 for $7.50. Even in 2021 dollars, that's cheap. It's less than an autographed Blu-ray copy of Clown Nato. When he was 16, Mickey met his first wife, Judy, in the most Mickey Thompson way possible. He met her at a stoplight and challenged her to a race. Their budding romance was defined by a mutual love of cars. In fact, many of their dates included dumpster diving at car dealerships for parts. So, of course they got married. By the time Mickey was in his early 20s, he was either blasting down the quarter mile in a home-built hot rod or working odd jobs to support his young family. And finally, in 1953, 25-year-old Mickey's life slipped into high gear, where it remained for the rest of his days. That year, he drove in his first major road race, and holy crap, you guys, did he pick a gnarly one. La Carrera Panamericana was a 2,000-mile, five-day marathon rally on Mexico's public roads, running from Guatemala to Texas, and it's widely considered one of the most dangerous races in the world. Now, unfortunately for Mickey, it lived up to the name. La Carrera introduced our hero to the kind of tragedies that would haunt him for the rest of his life. On the very first morning of the race, things were going well. Mickey roped a local teenager named Roger Flores into acting as his navigator, and he sweet-talked a local car dealer into hooking the duo up with a six-cylinder Ford sedan for the race. Now, let me repeat that. A 25-year-old Mickey Thompson convinced a local teenager to help him navigate along the most dangerous race in the world. Then, a Ford dealer was like, you guys look cool. Here, top out this brand new car on Mexico's public roads for a week. Needless to say, Mickey and Roger were stoked, dude. Unfortunately, the good vibes didn't last long. Early in the race, they came around a sharp corner in a small town and found a crowd of people gawking at another driver's accident. Now Mickey swerved around a little girl and his Ford flipped off the road into the middle of the crowd. By the time the dust settled, six people were dead. 
The incident scarred Mickey and certainly had something to do with him developing so much racing safety equipment later in life, like water-filled crash barriers and that little cloud guy uh, who tells you when you're going the wrong way. <coughs> the incident was tragic, but it didn't keep young Mickey Boy from entering La Carrera the very next year. This time, he drove a V8-powered Ford nicknamed Insuladera, or Salad Bowl. Mick finished in the lead on day one, but the next day he broke a tie rod and hit a wall at 90 miles per hour, destroying his car and any chance at finishing the race. You know, maybe this string of bad luck showed Mickey that road racing wasn't his thing, so he switched his attention to the fastest growing motorsport in SoCal, drag racing. As a lifelong tinkerer with an uncanny ability to make cool stuff out of junk, Mickey was enthralled by the innovation going down in drag racing's early years. He was a bit of an innovator himself. In 1954, fresh out of Mexico, he designed and built the first slingshot dragster by moving the driver's seat behind the rear axle. The upside, it improved traction thanks to increased weight over the back wheels. The downside, with the engine directly in front of the driver, any kind of mechanical failure sprays flames and or hot oil straight in your face. Did this guy have a death wish? Despite riding in the literal danger zone, the slingshot style was the industry standard until the 70s. And Mickey, at just 27 years old, was at the forefront of drag racing. As his wife Judy once said, Mickey has a lot of ideas, and he had all the energy anyone could ask for. He fed people the most impressive lines of bull and then he made it all happen. That's how Mickey Thompson moved his career forward. It's certainly how he made a name for himself as the manager of LA's Lions Drag Strip, where he was hired in 1955. At Lions, Mickey introduced the world to the so-called Christmas tree staging light system that's now a standard at literally every drag strip in the world. Mickey Thompson invented that. Before that, they just had a, a guy go like this. Under Mickey's management, Lions was one of the biggest drag strips in the nation. It was also kind of a madhouse. If he thought someone was cheating, he'd fight him <laughs> straight up. One time, he brought in a horse to race against a car because he thought it was funny. He was a wild man and he was smart enough to capitalize the best parts of his memorable personality to further his career. But he wasn't just a bull he was a genuine, loyal guy. At Lions, Mickey met and befriended a like-minded guy, Fritz Voigt. Fritz had a thing for breaking down barriers of speed just like Mickey, so they decided to try their hand at land speed racing. In 1958, they dropped two fire-breathing Chrysler Hemi V8s into a homemade four-wheel drive torpedo with a streamlined aluminum body and took it to Bonneville Salt Flats to see what it could do. What could it do? How about 294 miles per hour, okay? This shattered the previous US land speed record by 28 miles per hour, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's quite a bit. That wasn't crazy enough. Mickey and Fritz built a bigger, faster, even more eight land speed racer, the Challenger 1. This baby had not one, not two, not two and a half, not three, not 3.7, four, supercharged Pontiac V8 engines. Mickey and Fritz hit 406.6 miles per hour at Bonneville, making Mickey the first American to break 400 miles per hour. Unfortunately, due to a broken drive shaft, Mickey couldn't perform a return run and the international land speed record couldn't officially be his because you got to do one out and one back and then they take the average of the two. In 1959, Mickey expanded into manufacturing, forming Mickey Thompson Enterprises, which started out building custom aluminum pistons and branched out to include the racing tires Thompson is most known for today. That year, he also adopted a pet lion and named him Charlie. Things were crazy, but I guess they weren't crazy enough. As Mickey was in his 30s now, and he had an insatiable appetite for breaking records. But Bonneville had done him dirty, so he and Fritz set their sights on the Indy 500. Cause you know, why not? And in classic Mickey Thompson fashion, he had to go against the grain and make things way more complicated than they needed to be. In 1962, he entered three unique cars into the Indy 500. The engine sat behind the driver, similar to Formula One, they didn't win, but they got the Mechanical Achievement Award that year, which is the nerd prize. 
they got the nerd prize. Nothing's cooler than a nerd that can fight. Ah! The next year, Mickey entered five cars into the Indy 500, two of them from the previous year and three of what he called roller skate cars. These oddball race cars had tiny 12 inch wheels, which were seven inches wide up front and nine inches wide in the back. And the chassis were made of titanium, just like Zach Job's leg. True story, dude's got a titanium leg. No wins for the team that year either, but the next year, the next year also saw no wins. One big thing did happen at the 64 Indy 500 though. Mickey witnessed the second major tragedy of his young life. One of his drivers, David McDonald, lost control of his car and crashed in a fiery explosion, which killed him and another driver, Eddie Sachs. This devastated Mickey. His daughter said that she used to hear him crying about it late at night, which was the first time she'd ever heard her dad cry. After the crash, Mickey took a break from oval racing to focus on what he did best, break records at Bonneville. And break records he did! Between 1965 and 1968, Mickey set an astonishing 295 speed records. He also debuted a new land speed car, the Autolite Special, a skinny little earthbound rocket that clocked 411 miles per hour during testing. This thing was 30 feet long, less than three feet wide, barely big enough to hold the two Ford single overhead cam engines that moved it down the salt. And unfortunately, conditions once again interfered with his official speed runs and he wasn't able to put a record on the books. Now I'd lose my mind if trash like that kept happening to me. And I don't even have a lion to hang out with. So Mickey was like, you know what? Whatever, man. I already set like 6,000 records. Let's go try something new. So he founded Short Course Off-Road Enterprises, or SCORE, to promote off-road racing. Long story short, SCORE made off-road racing what it is today, a big dollar sport with fans all over the globe. Before this, it was a weirdo sport with no money and no fans. Just a bunch of maniacs careening around in the dirt, acting crazy, which sounds amazing. Actually, it sounds like Burning Man. No thanks. <laughs> Now around this time, in the late 60s, Mickey divorced his wife, Judy. But Mickey wasn't single for long because he's a race car guy and race car guys get married fast. He met a fetching woman named Trudy Feller. When was the last time you met a Trudy? Well, he met her camping in Arizona, 1971. He's like, damn, what's up, Feller? The two fell in love, they got married and founded the Mickey Thompson Entertainment Group, which held short course off-road racing events in stadiums. They loved working together, but with Mickey's health in decline, they realized that they needed some help running the business. So Mickey did the same thing that he did with Fritz. He found another wild man to help run the show. Mike Goodwin was a rock and roll promoter who branched into motocross in the early 80s. You know, like you do. He's known for wearing knee-length fur coats while boasting about his international hunting trips in his three-story mansion with an indoor waterfall. Yes! Yeah! Mike was bold, crass, crazy. So naturally, him and Mickey got along great. He seemed like the perfect business partner. With Mike on board, Mickey and Trudy could spend more free time together, camping in Arizona and elsewhere. Trudy and Mickey were very in love and I wish that I could tell you that they lived happily ever after. But in 1988, Mickey and Trudy were murdered. Why? On the morning of March 16th, 1988, two hooded gunmen sat waiting outside Mickey and Trudy's home in the wealthy community of Bradbury, California. Their enormous house was heavily secured with gated entrances and a high concrete wall, but that apparently wasn't enough. When Mickey opened the garage door for his wife and then walked to his car, the gunman opened fire. The gunman sprayed Mickey with bullets, then one dragged him out of the garage while the other fatally shot Trudy. Mickey was then unceremoniously shot in the head. These guys came to kill. The trailblazing speedster was 59 years old and Trudy was only 41. And as a final f you to the car loving Mickey, the two assailants fled on bicycles. Don't trust cyclists. When the police arrived on the scene, they were surprised to find the victim's jewelry and cash were undisturbed. That eliminated robbery as a motive. So what else could it be? It wasn't long before the couple's friends tipped off police on who might want Mickey dead. His ex-business partner and fur coat aficionado, Mike Goodwin. 
The first two events the Mickey Thompson Entertainment Group held with Mike as a partner lost money. Now that sucks, but it's pretty normal in business. Well, Mickey's office noticed an accounting discrepancy shortly afterward. Turns out, Mike hadn't put up for his share of the losses, so Mickey and Mike parted ways somewhat amicably with Mike promising to stick to motorcycles and Mickey continuing with off-road buggies and trucks to keep it non-competitive. Well, guess what? Mike didn't keep his promise and at his very next event, he added buggy races. Mickey sued his former partner and won a settlement for $750,000 in 1985. Mike retaliated by filing for bankruptcy and countersuing Mickey. And for the next three years, these guys tried to outdo one another with legal maneuvers. And as you might imagine, things kept escalating. Mike made threats against Mickey and his family to anyone who'd listen. He did this so much that a friend of Mickey's, Detroit OG rock and roll dickhead Ted Nugent, advised him to start carrying a gun. But to be fair, <laughs> Ted Nugent advises everyone to start carrying a gun. Mickey didn't think that Mike was capable of violence, but Trudy, however, was terrified. Mike was clearly crazy, and at this point, he was hovering just above rock bottom. You don't push someone when they got nothing to lose. By March 14th, two days before the murder, Mike made a settlement offer to Mickey's lawyer for the most recent lawsuit, and they turned him down. Was this the final push? At this point, Mike owed Mickey $768,000. He'd also hired an ex-cop to follow Mickey's lawyer around, purchased $275,000 worth of gold coins, and wired half of a million bucks to banks in the Caribbean. Honestly, I imagine this is pretty normal behavior for a guy like Mike. And maybe the cops thought so too, because when they investigated him in connection to the Thompson murders, they couldn't find enough evidence to charge him with anything. A few months after the murders, Mike and his wife left the country on their 57-foot yacht. The two avoided California for the next four years, and despite the hit TV show Unsolved Mysteries coverage of the case in 1989, nothing concrete has ever materialized. At least not yet. More than a decade later, another true crime TV show, America's Most Wanted, covered the case. The episode was a hit, and it led to a mountain of fresh tips. One of them came from Mickey's former neighbor who said that he saw two white men parked in a rusty Malibu scoping out Mickey's house with binoculars a week before the murder. I guess it took this guy 20 years to come forward with this. He identified none other than Mike Goodwin. Mike Goodwin was arrested. When they put Mike in the police lineup, both Mickey's neighbor and the neighbor's wife picked him out as the man sitting in the station wagon scoping out the Thompson house. When Mike finally went to trial for planning the murders five years later, the prosecution called over 40 witnesses to testify of his bad character, including eight people who had said they had been personally threatened by Mike. Mike's defense lawyer claimed that even though her client was a jerk, an egomaniac, and a braggart, that doesn't mean he was guilty of murder, especially when there was no physical evidence tying him to the scene. In January 2007, after six days of jury deliberation, Mike Goodwin was found guilty on two charges of first-degree murder. He got consecutive life terms with no possibility of parole. So what about the two guys who physically carried out the murders? Well, nobody knows. They've never been caught. As for Mike Goodwin, he remains in prison where he keeps himself busy with a new hobby, offering theories on who really carried out the murders. But I guess if there's one thing to take away from this story, it's be careful who you do business with. I wish I knew who killed Mickey Thompson. Mickey Thompson. Hey friend, I know where you're at. You forgot to get a gift for the donut fan in your life and it's too late for anything to be shipped. Well, you're in luck because donut media gift cards are a thing and you can get them in some phenomenal increments. I'm talking $25, $50, $75, $100, $150. And if you want to do something crazy like $7,500, give me a call and we'll work something out. The Donut Media gift cards are 100% digital. They don't rely on the old school guy on a horse delivering things, which is how I assume things still get to people and each of them are designed after an 80s credit card, which is a genius idea that I came up with in literally three seconds. So head on over to DonutMedia.com and pick up your perfect stocking stuffer today.
Thank you guys so much for watching this video and everything else on Donut. If you're not already subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss anything. I hope you liked this story. Follow me on Instagram and socials at James Pumphrey. Uh, go to donutmedia.com, get yourself some merch. We got a new item dropping every single week. Get on the mailing list for discounts. We have a point system now for discounts. I love you.